I'm delighted to be the teaching pastor here. As Kyle mentioned to you, uh, my, my job here is to open God's word and read it to you, and I have the best job in the world because I absolutely love God's word. There's something living and active about this. This represents the thoughts and ideas of the God that spoke the universe into existence, the one who made your soul, and you know in your conscious mind that you were made for communion with this being, and in here is where you will find him. If you are searching for God, we would love to help, but my best advice is search where he can be found, please. And that's what we do. We read God's word verse by verse, and we have really uh, started to get into the book of Daniel, uh, Old Testament book of Daniel, and we are uh, going to maybe finish up the second chapter of that today. Uh, let's see if we can kind of review this a little bit. If, if this book takes place in history in 605 B.C., when King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king of Babylon, uh, invades Babylon, he takes back to his temple in Babylon some of the things from the temple in Jerusalem, and he also takes back some of the young people. And the, the, here's the fab four here. Uh, in blue are their given Hebrew names, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. In red are the names that the Babylonians gave them after carrying them off into captivity. Belta Belteshazzar, Instead of being uh, God is my judge, they named Daniel Baal's prince. Instead of being Yahweh has shown grace, they renamed Hananiah Shadrach at the command of Aku, one of, one of their many gods. Uh, Mishael, meaning who is like God, became Meshach, who is like Aku. And Azariah, meaning Yahweh has helped, became Abednego meaning slave of the god Nabu, right? So just think of yourself for a minute. These are teenage boys, probably around 15 years old historically. They're carried off into captivity. They were selected so that they could be brainwashed to one day represent the Babylons and rule Judah as puppet dictators that had been brainwashed, like the Manchurian candidate. They would rather have not gone. I can assure you that. If you've ever been 15, <laughs> some of you look really close to that right now. Uh, I've, I've been a while for me, but at 15, you're very sensitive to separation anxiety, leaving home, leaving things that are familiar, and I can assure you they would have rather stayed. But uh, God made it so that they would spend the rest of their lives in Babylon, a foreign country. I can assure you that's not what they wanted. But these were godly young men forced to live in an ungodly culture. And that is probably the best paradigm we can adopt as we study this book to understand what it means. And, and that's the similar situation that I think we're all in. Uh, trying to be godly people living in a culture that isn't always godly. And that might be hard for us. I, I, don't, I'm, I don't ever want to be political about this, but it, honestly, it doesn't really matter to me whether America was founded on Christian principles or not. We could have that debate. It's fun, but it's an absolutely academic debate because it isn't now. I'm sorry. We see it all around. So we are, we are living in Babylon right now. That's the book of Daniel. It tells us what it's like to be living in Babylon, and, and we should try to gain wisdom from that as, as we are living in a culture that is not necessarily friendly to us. So we've seen how these four young men in chapter 1 and 2, we, we had to go pretty fast through chapter 2. There's great stories in there. And, and I, pull, I told you, I pulled a muscle in my jaw going through it last week. So there's a, there's a few things I want to point out to you. We've, we saw these guys, these four young men, obey God. They refused the king's food, and God rewarded them. And he didn't just reward them by keeping them alive and making them look healthier. Actually, the, I, I told you the word is fatter. They looked fatter, which is encouraging to me <laughs> that at some point in human history that was synonymous with good health. I'd have been one of the healthiest Babylonian children. <laughs> they, they. But God doesn't just reward them with that because they abstained from the king's food. 
It, it told us in, in chapter 1, verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. That's a gift from God given to these people. And see, it's that last part. It's Daniel understanding the dreams. That, that's really what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. That, that was a big deal here. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that disturbed him in chapter 2. And it disturbed him probably because he couldn't remember it. But it, it, it also disturbed him because he knew that there was something important in this dream. It was something that he needed to remember, and it was recurring, and he couldn't sleep. And he, he was finally driven to ask all of his advisors, and we, we refer to them with air quotes as wise men. And he, he asked them, tell me to, what this dream means and they say, well, tell us what the dream is, and we'll tell you what it means. That's what we do, right? I mean, you know, I had a dream the other night. I was surrounded by cats, and one of them kept sniffing me, right? And they say, well, you're obviously due for a cat scan. <laughs> they don't all have to be, like, good. You can use that with your family. This is a tough crowd. This is going to be a bad, long day, isn't it? <laughs> See, no, their, their game was, you tell us the dream, and we'll go to our book, and we'll tell you what it means. And the king says, no, I don't want to play that game. I want you to tell me the dream, and then tell me what it means, right? Now, it could be because he forgot it. That really, it could be because I can't remember it. Or it could be because I think you guys are phonies, and you want to prove to me that you have the power to tell me what it means? Tell me what it was, okay? Either way, his advisors were kind of shocked by this, and they told him the truth. They said, there's not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. And this was an interesting statement because that kind of sets the stage for the showdown, the smackdown between the real god and these phony gods, right? And we, we noticed that their, uh, the king uh, was not happy with their answer. Uh, when, he, when they finally came clean and told him that, he ordered that they all die. Um, and that's not happy. We noticed that there's something here that happened in chapter 2 when he ordered their death that it, it happens a couple of times in Daniel, and it's also a theme throughout the Bible, and that is sometimes human kings make these broad, sweeping declarations, and people get caught up in that. And we're going to see that happen a lot in Daniel, and unfortunately we see that happen a lot with the kingdoms of, of, of men. See, I, I think the king has good reason to doubt these people. I really do. Uh, and I, I, I really think that his judgment that they are not telling him the truth or that they really don't have the power they ever said they had is probably wise. So there's some, there's some um, discernment uh, and, and some justice involved in his skepticism. But then, you know, kill them all, off with all their heads. You know, the, the, this is where, where human beings fail to carry out the will of God. See, our justice, when we respond, is far too sweeping, far too broad. You could say we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The Word of God is like a two-edged sharp sword that is able to divine between soul and spirit, and joint and marrow, right? Hebrews 4.12. The reaction of man is like trying to crack an egg open with a sledgehammer. It's too broad. We don't know the intentions of people, so our reactions are always broad. This is part of what was illustrated because some innocent people got caught up in this, off with all their heads, and, and among them, Daniel and his friends. Uh, their answer made the king so angry and furious. He wasn't just angry. He was angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. And see, they get caught up in the net of the king's justice. Daniel, tactfully and with God's help, asks for more time. The king grants him more time. He and his friends go back and they pray to God for mercy and they pray for the answer to the dream. And Daniel gets the answer and he tells the king. He says, you, king, 
You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. This is a picture of that, in case you can imagine. There you can see the different parts of that. And this was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Hmm? And Daniel, by telling him about it, had done what no one else could do. Really think about that. He not only told him what the dream meant, which is cryptic, but he told them the dream that he had never known. And, and that, that brings us to where I'd like to begin our study today. The very concluding verses of chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and, offered that it, and, and ordered that an offering of incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord. And the mouth of the Lord has spoken it to you and me. Seems like we got a happy ending here if we're ever going to get one, right? I mean, Daniel was right. Would have been awful if he was wrong. Daniel was right. The king acknowledged that. He honors Daniel. He honors Daniel's God, Daniel gets rewarded. His friends get rewarded, right? Everybody lives happily ever after, and, and that's absolutely true. But there's some things that happen in chapter 1 and 2 here that I want to point out to you. There's some things that help me. I want to dig in, and I want to notice. 2,600 years ago now in human history, I want to notice, and I want you to help today take notice of all the ways that God was intervening to prepare the way for his people. And so the title of today's sermon is God Preparing the Way for His People, which is what, we're, what we actually see here more in chapters 1 and 2 than all the beautiful narrative and stories which make great veggie tales. And it's all, I believe every word of it's true, but there's something really cool that's going on. I really wish I could remember one day as the senility develops, I will probably attribute it to my grandfather. But actually a pastor one time told me that God is always easier to see in the rear view mirror. And I wish I could remember the pastor because that's wise. And, and I'm, I hope you can relate to that. I, you know, can, maybe some of you can. It, it might be just a confession that, that in my life, it's real easy for me now to see all of God's providential influence in my life in the past. It, it, unfortunately, though, and this is what I, as I go into tomorrow, I still have this fear that he's not going to be present in the future. That's a confession. That's silly, isn't it? I mean, God, I, as, as I've walked with God long enough, I've seen every place he has intervened. Why do I doubt he's going to do that in the future? I'm just confessing that I do. Can any of you relate to that? Okay, I hope so. Otherwise, I'm just, maybe you should, somebody else should be teaching this. But there's a verse in 2 Kings that I've always thought of when it comes to this. And it's Elisha and his servant Gehazi. Gehazi is a real good name for a cat if you're looking for one. <laughs> Elisha, remember, was the protege, protege of Elijah. And Elisha's servant Gehazi, they got trapped. There's a whole bunch of people around him, and Gehazi's freaking out. We're in trouble here, man. And Elisha says to him, don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Gehazi's like, what? And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You remember this verse? You remember this story? I can look back and I can see that in my life. Can you? 
looking forward, I wish I could live every day like that. And, and I want to. I want to. One of the ways that I think might help me, and I hope it will help you too, is I want to I show you all the places where God did this in Daniel. So let's go back here a little bit and let's talk about some of the things that happened in this Babylonian captivity. The entire nation of Judah is going into captivity in Babylon, but it's strange that it happens in three phases. There's the first phase that got Daniel involved in 605 B.C., there's the second phase in 598 B.C. where just a few more people were taken, among them the prophet Ezekiel, right? And then finally in uh, 587, the entire nation of Judah is either killed, scattered, or taken to Babylon. Tens of thousands of people, it's difficult to know how many, are taken to Babylon. God is doing this because he is disciplining his people. Now, this is interesting. We've got to be careful here because diff discipline is different than punishment, right? We, 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 discipline is a loving correction, and God disciplines those he loves, right? So God's making a loving correction to his people. He says, you know what? These people, they, they not only have, have done what I've told them isn't right, they've actually forgotten me. So I have to do this to remind them. But I still love them. So I'm going to prepare a way for them. I'm not sending them to Babylon without preparing the way for them. This is what God's doing. And this, I think, is the purpose behind Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Right? The dream was about the future. And there's lots of elements to that dream, that statue. It's really interesting to try and lay that over 2,600 years of history and see where it fits. And I mean, it's, it is really interesting. And people do that a lot. That's fine, I, I, unless you kind of get too caught up in it. I, I, think, I think the one thing, though, that we might want to recall is that there really is no perfect fit to that dream. There really isn't, because there's some things in it that either haven't come true or they had to have come true in the past, and it seems like we haven't seen that yet. But I think the biggest thing is, let's forget all that for a minute. Who was the dream given to? Nebuchadnezzar. What, then, was in it for Nebuchadnezzar? What was God trying to tell Nebuchadnezzar before all of his people were going into captivity? And, and I, I thought of three big things, and there may be more. But first of all, he's telling this king that there is indeed one God. All of the quote-unquote little gods that you think, no, there is one God. And the second thing he's telling is, you know, God put you in charge. You, your being king at this moment is an act of God. He put you in charge, and he is tasking you with certain things, including taking care of his people. And then the third thing is, you know, these wise men that claim to be the spokesman for those little gods, they're worthless, but Daniel, Daniel is the spokesperson for me. You can, you can talk to Daniel. Daniel will tell you about me. I think those are the three big lessons, right? Some of those we don't need to talk about too much. The idea that there is indeed one God, I mean, he, he, he comes pretty clear with that. But it, but it was interesting that, remember, Babylon lived in this pluralistic thing where there, there were multiple gods, and the more gods, the better. We conquer a nation. You have how many gods? 17. Add them to our 63, and we'll have, let's see, uh, 90 gods. Say 80 gods. We'll have 80 gods. That'll be great. You know, and they just thought that made things better. And each god had some representative, some wise men who represented that, and it, it just became silly. And I think Nebuchadnezzar knew that was wrong. And I think God's saying to him, you're right. That was wrong. Those things have no power, and those people that claim to represent them have no power, but there is one God, and there's one little Hebrew teenage boy that I'm going to use to teach you about him. I think the second thing that God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know was that your kingdom is ordained by God. The authority you have isn't because you did so great, right? You didn't hit a triple. You woke up on third base. I put you there. Right? And Daniel told him that. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he's placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. 
wherever they live, he has made you ruler over all of them. You are the head of gold. So when Daniel's explaining the dream to him, he's saying, you are this leader. God has put you there. Now, this sounds really very lofty, but you know we took it a little bit apart last week. It's really eerily similar to what God intended us to be over his creation. In Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, let, let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. That's interesting. That sounds very similar to the commission given to Nebuchadnezzar. I wonder, this must be what God intends human being. God must intend human government to be like this. I didn't get a chance to show you this last week, but there's another in Psalm 8. And you've heard this. So Psalm 8 has this beautiful beginning. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and beasts of the field, birds of the air and fish of the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. You hear it again? I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not making this stuff up. God's intention for us is to be like a co-regent leader, an ambassador of God to creation. Isn't that beautiful? It goes all the way back to Adam. It was reminded there in Babylon. And I wonder as we walk around, do we feel like that? I don't always, especially when I'm driving on LBJ. I do not always feel like God's ambassador. Of, that's why I don't put one of them Jesus fish on the back of my car. <laughs> the gospel's offensive enough. I don't need to add to it, right? He, he, seriously, though, human beings fail to govern the way God intended. We, we all do. Adam did. Every government did. And Nebuchadnezzar will as well. But God is reminding him, this is the standard I'm holding you to before you take my people with you, Right? What we tend to do is not act the way God wanted us to be ruler over creation. We tend to act like the beasts that we were supposed to be ambassadors to. Does that make sense? And that contrast, that whole idea of us being beasts, that's a biblical theme that is going to play out beginning in chapter 4 all the way through the book of Daniel. So this is really interesting. God is about to entrust his people, tens of thousands of his people. He's reminding Nebuchadnezzar what the standard is before that. And I, I hope we caught that. And he's also reminding them that, that these traditional wise men, they really didn't know anything. But Daniel does. I'm replacing the people that didn't know with a little teenage Hebrew boy who does. And, and that is kind of interesting to me. Uh, and that's the only possible explanation that Nebuchadnezzar got that for what happened in verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. Okay, um, yeah, this is funny. This word prostrate, this position means hands out on your face. The greatest king at that time that God ordained and was given rule of the entire world is on his face before a teenage Jewish kid. Right? Uh, and, and this man had ordered his death less than a day ago. And a complete reversal of fortune. Isn't that interesting? Now, it looks like as he's bowing down that maybe he's worshiping Daniel. Now, he clarifies it here. Then the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. That's exactly what Daniel told him. When Daniel was called to speak to him, he said, you know, he says, can you reveal this to me? He says, no one can, but there is a God in heaven who can. And Nebuchadnezzar now has got that message. There is a God, and he speaks through Daniel. And this is interesting, because those two verses tell us something interesting. <laughs> it's, that, it's that you understand, you're not worshiping Daniel, but you are going to give him honor, because this little teenage boy is going to speak for me. And that is, that's amazing. This, he is not God, but he is a servant of the Most High God. Charles Stanley told me one time, over the airwaves, it wasn't just with me, he was <laughs> telling millions of people. I, I don't want to make it sound like we have regular conversations. 
Charles, I heard Charles Stanley say one time that he was introduced in a, in a, uh, one time to an audience as Charles Stanley's servant of the Most High God, and he said it took me back. I couldn't speak for a minute. It's true, isn't it? Uh, that's how we must walk. That's how we must interface with the culture. <laughs> it doesn't really sound great to say Bill Rector, servant of the Most High God, when I'm driving down LBJ. But that's the paradigm. That's what we need to be to a culture that desperately needs to know the Most High God. Amen? Amen. Now, as if the king bowing before a teenage Hebrew child isn't shocking enough, then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon. What? A ruler. He placed him in charge of all its wise men. We read this too fast. This is a 15-year-old. Right? Remember, we're told this happened in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. He has, he, he's got to still be a teenager. And he's from a captured nation. And Nebuchadnezzar makes him the ruler over the province. Now, just really as a quick aside, that province, it probably is a little bit like New York, New York, right? Where there's a city and then there's a state. So there's the nation of Babylon and inside there were provinces and one of the biggest provinces was Babylon, inside of Babylon. So this is just the province. It's not the country. But still, what's going on? Right? And of course, Daniel doesn't forget his friends. You want to make me leader? Well, can I bring these three dudes along with me? Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. So he's negotiating with the king. You want to make me the problem? Tell you what, let these guys rule the province. I need to be at your royal court. And the king says, fine, that's a better idea. Right. The, what? <laughs> Just before we leave this point, you know, I, I, can, I have a tendency to speak in hyperbolic language in case you don't know that. My kids are always pointing out, you know, it's, you look like you're warm. I said, yeah, it's like 10 million degrees in here, right? So I want to be careful to say this is the most important thing in the whole book. But that's what I feel like here. I feel like in all of chapter 1 and 2, the most important thing to me is they tried to kidnap these four guys to make them the puppet leaders that they could send back. And God's idea was, oh, yeah? Tell you what. You go ahead. How about I make them rulers over you before I bring my people? Do you get that? Do you see what God was doing? i got to discipline my people. I've got to. But before I let them come into captivity, I'm going to let four Hebrew kids who are still in their teens be in charge of the biggest province, and I'm going to put one of them in the royal court. I must have read Daniel five times before that hit me. And I hope it hits you today. Maybe some of you are like, well, I saw that all along. <laughs> What's with this pastor? I don't know, but it, when it finally hit me, I was like, I never saw it before. I was so hepped up in the statue and everything. I, never, I really never saw the complete reversal of fortune in chapter 1 and 2. And God preparing the way. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? All because of that dream. All because of that dream. Sometimes, I, I, sometimes I, I won't say we. Sometimes I miss the biggest meaning in the Bible that's embedded in some of the most famous verses, in some of the most famous chapters. There is another thing God is doing here, and I wanna, I'll cover it as quickly as I can, but it's important to me because I'm a nerd. And I've, I've confessed that to you. When I was in high school, I never liked nerds, but then God made me their king. And I've told you that, and some of you are like, what do you mean? I was the headmaster of a school where you started learning Latin at age nine, and you continued Latin for seven years, and you read Dante. Kids in my math class, I couldn't get them to shut up because they were arguing over the meaning of Dante. What were you doing in 10th grade? I, mean, I was arguing as to whether Van Halen or ACDC was the best band around, right? <laughs> These guys are arguing over Dante, and I'm just like, you are such nerds, and I am your king. <laughs> so I learned to love them, right? Okay, I do want to go back to this. I skipped over this in verse 48. I want to go back to it because this is kind of, this is another one of those things that God was doing that you, we wouldn't have known for a little while. 
king placed Daniel in a high position, lavish men. He made him rule over the entire province. He placed him in charge of all its wise men. This teenage boy is in charge of these older, wise men. How do you think that went over? Right? Right? How do you think that went over? Well, and I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar was like, you know what? I'd just soon have them dead. You like them enough? You wanted to spare their life? I'll put you in charge of them then. And some of these older guys probably resented that. I think I might. But I also think that they, they remember that Daniel did, in fact, spare their life. Remember, right after God revealed the dream to him, he says to Arioch, the king's commander, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. He didn't have to say that. He did not have to say that. He could have sat there and waited and said, hey, Arioch, kill all those other guys first, and then I'm going to make you look like a hero by revealing the dream to the king. He didn't. For some reason, he spared them, and I've always wondered why. You know, they might have resented it, but remember, the king wasn't just threatening to, like, make it a a quick, simple death. He was going to hack them to pieces and then turn their houses to rubble, which means it would have been visited upon their family. So Daniel spared them that. I'm guessing that however much they might have resented the age difference. You know, I make a lot of millennial jokes, but if a millennial saves me from being hacked to bits, (laughs) I'm in, buddy. Tell me, what do we need to do? I'll even try body wash if that's the deal, man. Just tell me, what do we do as millennials? I'm in. My day, we called it soap, but it's just, you know, I'm good with it, whatever you want to call it. This is why I'm such a shameful teacher. I just, I go off on these tangents. So I actually think that these wise men probably listened to Daniel. I think they probably did, because some of them, I'm sure, regretted it. We're going to hear about that. There's a few that are holding grudges, but I think most of them actually listened to him. And, and they had something to listen to, right? I mean, Daniel was telling them about God. And Daniel actually did what they only claimed they could do for years. So, uh, you know, some tells me they were actually listening. And they probably learned something. Some of them did. You know, these wise men that we talk about, they're famous in, in history, in anthropology, There's this group of wise astronomer priests, right? And see, as astronomers, they're first-rate scientists. They made incredible observations of the sky. It is said that Babylonian astronomers could predict eclipses, right? That's pretty good. But then they tried to take that knowledge and use it to predict the future. That's a little mystical. So you get get this, this weird combination, the astronomer priests weirdo class kind of a thing. And that's what they were. And by the way, they transcended Babylon. They weren't just in Babylon. They were there long before Nebuchadnezzar. They they originated from the Medes. They went through the Persians. They were with the Babylonians. And they survived hundreds of years after Nebuchadnezzar. So this kind of, best I could kind of recollect it, these were like astronomer, mathematician, nerd priests (laughs) that were like German rocket scientists, Right? Their, their loyalty was, it didn't matter whether, you know, so if somebody invaded Babylon, we take those guys and we put them in our, our government because we want them too, right? You've got your nerds, I've got mine kind of a thing. Every nation wanted them. Their observations of the sky explain some things that you might have, might have already wanted to know. I mean, maybe you didn't, but they're really the first people that charted the fact that while the earth is going around a thousand miles an hour every day, it's also taking a one-year lap around the sun. And they charted that, that they thought it was a circular movement. It turns out it's elliptical, but that's not bad for 2,600 years ago. And they, they tracked the cycle. <laughs> Babylon, these Babylonian astronomer uh, mathematicians also, their number system was based on 60 which is really interesting to me. It's going to actually play out a little bit more in Daniel. Their number system was based on 60 because they didn't like having, they didn't like fractions. They didn't like having to divide numbers. Like, how can I divide 10 into thirds? I can divide 60 into thirds. I can divide it into fourths, fifths, sixths, wh- lots of portions. So they, they knew the earth was going around the circle and it moved just about this much. And they said, let's make it 360, and that's why, if some of you have ever wondered, there's 360 degrees in a complete circle. It's, we owe this to the Babylonian astronomer, nerd, mathematicians. They use that to track time, 
And so that's why there's 60 seconds in a minute. That's why there's 60 minutes in an hour. It's all of this we attribute to these incredible Babylonian astronomer priests. I don't know if you've ever known that before. It's fascinating to me. They had a name. They were known as Magi. You've probably heard of that before. Magi, that's the astronomer, priest, nerd, mathematician class of people. The, the word Magi appears in your Bible. It appears twice. It appears once here in the book of Daniel, and it also appears at the birth of Jesus in Matthew. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, nerds from the east came. <laughs> okay, it's technically, it's Magi. I feel like putting a, a text note in there. Some versions say nerd. <laughs> Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, there's, there's a lot in here. I want to leave this up for a minute. Where did they see his star? In the east. Where was Jesus born? West of them. Did you ever catch that? That's why not everybody followed that star. How did they know he was king of the Jews? Daniel told them over five centuries ago. See, Daniel had knowledge of God, and they listened to him. Daniel, in chapter 9, was told of the Messiah and when he would come, and he told them, and they listened. And like good nerds, they wrote it down, and they passed it on for over five centuries until the sign in the east that Daniel predicted, and they knew Let's go see. And they end up in Jerusalem. It's an amazing story of how God not only prepared the way for his people during the captivity in Babylon, but he prepared the way for the authentication of his Messiah over five centuries before it would happen. Isn't that awesome? I hope you see that in the book of Daniel. I hope you also see it in your own life. Brothers and sisters, this same God is preparing things for you and me and has prepared them before we were born. And if you walk with him long enough, you might see them in the rearview mirror. And if we remind each other and encourage each other like I need you to do for me and I promise I will do for you, maybe walking into the future won't be so scary knowing that God has always prepared the way for his people. And I see no reason to doubt he will do so and isn't doing so now. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, help us to see how you have worked in our past. All the ways. Illuminate, like Elisha's servant, all of the ways you have helped us in the past. And Father, help me to walk into the future with the same confidence that I have when I think of how you've acted in my past. If it would be your will, Father, use this church and your servants of the Most High God that dwell in here. Use us in such a way that we can let others know about you and your glory as Daniel did for King Nebuchadnezzar and as Daniel did for the wise men of Babylon. Lord, help us to persevere through difficult times. And be willing to set aside our own comfort, just like Daniel and his friends, for the sake of your glory, which we give entirely to you and trust ourselves into your hands. And it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.